atomic warfare among ancient civilizations may sound like something out of a science fiction novel, but descriptions of similar deadly occurrences can be found in the very same text Dr. Oppenheimer quoted after the New Mexico atomic test. So the ancient astronaut theory claims that the Mahabharata speaks of nuclear warfare. Let's see what specifically they say it says. One reference that we have, for example, speaks of these explosions that were brighter than a thousand suns. And when these blasts occurred, the suns were twirling in the air. Trees went up in flames and there was just this mass destruction. After those blasts, people who survive started to lose their hair and nails started to fall out. I mean, right there, we have a concise reference to radiation poisoning, nuclear fallout. And those texts are thousands of years old. The Mahabharata actually doesn't say any of that. These exact claims about the hair and nails falling off and an explosion brighter than a thousand suns has been repeated by ancient astronaut theorists so many times that they think it's true. But the origin of this line was from a French book called Morning of the Magicians. No one that makes this claim will actually cite where in the Mahabharata this claim appears, which makes it very difficult for people to call them out on this, because the Mahabharata contains over 1.8 million words. So if you just say, it's in there somewhere, just trust me, you can pretty much get away with anything. As you might have guessed by now, they have a really good reason for covering their tracks by not citing a reference. For instance, let's consider the claim about the people's hair and nails falling out because of this weapon. First of all, there was no weapon involved in that story. It was part of a bad omen, and this is what it actually says. Quote, the streets swarmed with rats and mice. Earthen pots showed cracks or broken from no apparent cause. At night, the rats and mice ate away the hair and nails of slumbering men. So rats chewed them off. It wasn't a result of nuclear fallout. What about the bomb blast that was brighter than a thousand suns? Here's what the passage actually says. Gratified with him, the Holy One then showed Yutanka that eternal Vaishnava form which Dayanjaya of great intelligence had seen. Yutanka beheld the high-souled Vasudeva of universal form, endued with mighty arms. The effulgence of that form was like that of a blazing fire or a thousand suns. It stood before him, filling all space. It had faces on every side. Behold the high and wonderful Vaishnava form of Vishnu. In fact, seeing the Supreme Lord in that guise, the Brahmana Yutanka became filled with wonder. Jason Colavito says the following about this, quote, This passage, which mentions the 10,000 sons, refers to an appearance of Vishnu. It is representative of many, many passages in which the standard poetic line 10,000 sons is used to describe a deity. It does not refer to the specific flash of a nuclear blast unless one imagines the gods to be exploding. If you would like to know more about the deceitful misquoting of ancient texts as it relates to this idea of ancient nuclear weapons, see Jason Colavito's excellent book, Ancient Atom Bombs, Fact, Fraud, and the Myth of Prehistoric Nuclear Warfare. Let's move on to Ancient Aliens' next line of evidence for this point, which is all centered around an ancient city, now archaeological site called Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan. Ancient aliens claims that there was a nuclear bomb dropped there in the ancient past. They give several reasons to believe this. Skeletons were found lying face down in the street, many holding hands. Their faces and body positioning suggested they suffered a sudden violent death. You have a culture of people who literally were lying dead in the street. Archaeologists have found human remains and something big has happened to these people. Why is there evidence that wild animals avoided scavenging their remains? And why, even after thousands of years, had their bones not decayed? In certain areas of that site, you find increased levels of radiation. British researcher David Davenport claimed to have found a 50-yard-wide epicenter at Mohenjo-Daro, where everything appeared to have been fused through a transformative process known as vitrification. Vitrification is a process in which regular-type stone 
gets molten into a magma state and then it hardens again. But once the stone is hardened again, it feels like glass. At Mohenjo-daro, we find evidence of vitrification, which could have only been achieved if the material was exposed to extreme heat by some type of a blast. Okay, so let's list these points. Number one, skeletons, one set holding hands, which they say appear to have died at the same instant. Number two, no evidence of scavengers. Number three, remarkably well-preserved bones. Number four, the presence of radiation at the site, and number five, an epicenter where vitrification is present. That all sounds like a pretty convincing case for nuclear warfare at Mohenjo-daro. Well, assuming any of that is true, and considering Ancient Aliens' track record, we had better investigate these claims. One of the first problems with this theory is the city itself. Its buildings are still intact, some of which are 15 feet high, and they're made out of mud. So you would think that a nuclear weapon whose main destructive power is in the force of its blast wave would be able to topple a few mud brick buildings. But moving on, what about these skeletons? Ancient Aliens makes it sound like a lot of skeletons were found, when in fact only 37 were found. And not only do these 37 bodies show no signs of dying suddenly, the date of their deaths varies sometimes as much as 1,000 years from one another. None of the archaeologists involved thought these skeletons suggested a sudden catastrophe. And to make matters worse for ancient aliens, all of the bodies were buried. The idea that these bodies were laying around in the streets isn't true. In fact, almost everything that ancient aliens said about this is completely untrue. The fact that they didn't die in the same instant, and the fact that they were buried in the normal way, explains why there was no signs of scavengers. Well, what about the remarkably well-preserved bones? This can be chalked up to Mohenjo-daro being literally one of the hottest places on Earth, with temperatures reaching 128 degrees. And because it's also really dry, it's the perfect climate for preservation. In fact, this is also probably the reason why the mud brick buildings are still standing as well. The problem with the claims about there being radiation at Mohenjo-daro is that we don't know where this claim came from. It certainly wasn't any of the scientists involved with the Mohenjo-daro digs that claimed it, and the ancient astronaut theorists don't cite any references with which to check this claim, so until the presence of radiation can be proven to exist at the site, there is no reason to address it. Well, what about this epicenter of vitrification? Well, according to archaeologists, it wasn't exactly an epicenter of anything. It was a small amount of broken pottery, which, because pottery is put in a fire to harden it, it contains a specific type of vitrification called frit. They threw in the word epicenter to make it seem more legitimate. But there is no epicenter of anything except pottery at this site. But this brings up an important point. Mohenjo-daro is not the only site that ancient astronaut theorists claim vitrification exists as a result of ancient atom bombs. So it would be instructive for us to look at sand vitrification and its different causes in order to address those claims. For example, there is fulgurite, which is sand fused by a lightning bolt. There is tektite, which is sand fused by the compressed force of a meteorite. There is frit, which is partially fused sand and other chemicals in the presence of heated pottery. That's what was found at Mohenjo-daro. Finally, there is trinitite, which is vitrified sand caused by a nuclear explosion. So, we first saw that the Mahabharata did not claim anything like what ancient aliens said it did. We saw that the bodies at Mohenjo-daro were not killed in a sudden disaster. In fact, they died a thousand years apart in some cases, and were clearly buried. The cases of radiation are a non-factor, the vitrification was caused by pottery, and we noted that if it was a nuclear explosion, it didn't even knock down the mud brick houses which are still standing at the site. Ancient Sanskrit texts dating back as far as 6000 BC. Wow, 6000 BC? Really? In reality, the oldest of these texts would be the Vedas, which date to between 500 and 1500 BC. Ancient Aliens just adds another 5,000 years, as if no one would notice. They're actually even contradicting themselves with this date 
because in another episode they correctly state that the oldest writings in the world are the Sumerian tablets, the oldest of which date to about 4000 BC. So why are they now saying that there are some writings 2000 years older than the oldest writings? I don't think anyone knows. Describe in varying but vivid detail flying machines called Vimanas. Vimanas are aeroplanes and they are powered by some jet engines. This seems to be true because all the description of the flight behavior, elephants ran away in panic. Grass was thrown out because there was a lot of pressure from behind those Vimanas. So that we can say this is a description of the spaceship. The word Vimana literally means having been measured out, and it was related to the king's palaces and was referring to their intricate construction. Later on, as a result, the word became synonymous with palaces in general, and because of that, it was used to refer to the palaces of the gods as well. And yes, these palaces of the gods were in the heavens, and they could fly. But as we look into this, it will be clear that some of the Vimanas of the gods really were huge palaces, with gardens and terraces and golden staircases. Then, because the palaces of the gods flew, the word gradually became used for anything that could fly, either in mythology or in reality. So understanding the palace concept in the development of the word Vimana is helpful in understanding what we will be looking at. But before we look into the real descriptions of Vimanas in the Vedic texts, we must first examine a fake text, because almost everything that ancient alien says about Vimanas comes from a totally bogus text called the Vimanaka Shastra. Although mainstream historians believe the Vimana texts are myths, many of the documents contain passages that seem to describe modern machinery and technology. The Vimanika Shastra goes into metals that are used in these craft. It talks about electricity and power sources. It talks about the pilots and the clothing they have to wear. It talks about the food that they eat. It talks even about the weapons that are kept on these airships. The flight manuals of the Vimanas are quite similar to the flight manuals you find in the modern passenger flight business or uh, when you go to the military jet engines. Of course, they have also flight manuals because it's necessary for a pilot to get knowledge about his plane he wanted to fly with. The Vimanaka Shastra is not an actual ancient text. It was channeled or dictated to the author from the spirit world in 1918. The spirit who supposedly dictated the text claimed to be an ancient seer named Bharadvata, who is prominent in some ancient writings. So I guess that's what's supposed to give this text credibility. That is, the idea that the ghost of someone ancient supposedly dictated it. But they're not even sure that version of the story is true, because the first mention of any of this is in 1952 by the guy who supposedly found and translated the text from 1918. So as far as anyone knows, he could have made the whole channeled by a famous ghost story up in 1952. The text itself reads like a technical manual, describing the details of how Vimanas operated. It includes the description of what must have sounded like a really technical idea in 1918 or 1952 called a mercury vortex engine. Ancient Alien spends a huge amount of time talking about this idea. The Vimanaka Shastra, or science of aeronautics, indicates Vimanas used a propulsion system based on a combination of gyroscopes, electricity, and mercury. Is this possible? Mercury is an unusual element. Mercury is metal, it's also a liquid, and uh, is a conductor of electricity. The Vimanaka Shastra suggests Vimanas were powered by several gyroscopes placed inside a sealed liquid mercury vortex. One of the texts talks about mercury rotating and driving some sort of a powerful wind or a windmill effect. That might be some sort of 
what we call a flywheel energy storage, where you have a spinning disk and then you extract energy from it slowly. That would be the mercury. And then that could be used to drive some sort of a propeller or what we call a ducted fan. Some of the other things that this text describes are equally scientific sounding. It even includes very technical drawings of the things that it's talking about. But when you look closer at all this, it becomes obvious that it is physically impossible for any of these craft to get off the ground. In fact, 20 years later, in 1974, a study was done on the texts and the drawings by the Aeronautical and Mechanical Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. I will quote Will Hunt, an American freelance writer based in India, for a description of how that study came out. Quote, as thoroughly as it had been written, the committee just as thoroughly dismantled the study in an essay called A Critical Study of the Work of Vamanika Shastra. They question whether the author, whoever that may have been, had any grasp of basic physics, chemistry, and electricity, not to mention the, quote, disciplines of aeronautics, aerodynamics, aeronautical structures, propulsive devices, materials, and metallurgy. Their conclusion, quote, none of the planes has properties or capabilities of being flown, the geometries are unimaginably horrendous from the point of view of flying, and the principles of propulsion make them resist rather than assist flying. Another writer, J.B. Hare, writing for the Sacred Text Archive, said the following of the craft in the Vamanika Shastra, quote, They are absurdly non-aerodynamic, brutalist wedding cakes, with minarets, huge ornithopter wings, and dinky propellers. I have a feeling that even though 90% of the information that Ancient Aliens presents on Vimanas comes from this text, they realize that it has been thoroughly discredited. And so, in an odd twist, after spending five minutes on how great the idea of a Mercury Vortex engine would be, they then let everyone know that the idea wouldn't actually work. They stop short, however, of saying that there's anything wrong with this text, they just say that there may have been a problem with the translation of a word or two. Flywheel energy storage systems, however, tend to lose power quickly. To navigate across space, its size would have to be enormous. It's, it's not at all clear that this would be a practical device. Now, maybe the people were trying to describe something that kind of looked like this to them. It might not have actually been mercury. It might have been some other liquid metal. The mercury vortex engine is perhaps a failure in the translation because uh, the uh, vortex is uh, not a material quite suitable to a jet engine. So let's move on to the mentions of Vimanas in the actual ancient Vedic texts. So as I've already mentioned, the word Vimana came to mean palace. And when it was the palace of a god, it was usually capable of flying around. When we look at the development of Vimanas chronologically, the mystery surrounding them vanishes. First of all, they were not even mentioned in the earlier texts. And when they finally were mentioned, the next thousand years of their being mentioned always included them having wheels and being drawn by horses, not exactly a mercury vortex engine. Then, around 500 BC, the chariots lose their horses and are depicted as flying on their own. Jason Colavito says the following about the first mentions of Vimanas without horses. Quote, the very first of these is the flying chariot of the earthly king Ravana, called Pushpaka. By the time of the Mahabharata, circa 400 BCE, these flying chariots had grown in size. One was now described as 12 cubits in circumference, but they never lost their large wheels that marked them as derived from earthly, horse-drawn chariots. It's also interesting to see that ancient astronaut theorists have to distort the actual descriptions of Vimanas in the Vedic texts in order to make them sound like UFOs. For example, the following is a quote from David Childress's book where he's supposed to be quoting a description of a Vimana from an ancient text. We'll read what he tells his readers what it says, and then we will read the actual ancient text and note the differences. First, let's hear Childress's version. Quote, when morning dawned, Rama, taking the celestial car Pushpaka had sent to him by Vipishand, stood ready to depart. Self-propelled was that car. It was large and finely painted. It had two stories and many chambers with windows, and was draped with flags and banners. It gave forth a melodious sound as it coursed along its airy way. 
And now here's what the actual Ramayana says, quote, And the mighty monkey ascended the splendid car Pushpaka, containing figures of wolves, made of Kartswara and Hiranya, graced with ranges of goodly pillars, as if blazing in splendor throughout, garnished with narrow secret rooms and saloons, piercing the heavens and resembling Miru or Mandara, and like unto the flaming sun, skillfully reared by Vikwakarma, with golden staircases and graceful and grand raised seats, rows of golden and crystal windows, and daises composed of sapphires, emeralds, and other superb gems, embellished with noble vidrumas, costly stones, and round pearls, and also with plastered terraces, pasted with red sandal, like unto gold, and furnished with a sacred aroma, and resembling the sun new risen. Calavito says of this, quote, Elsewhere it is described as being filled with fruit trees, and sometimes is drawn by geese. Do you know many UFOs with plastered terraces and red paint? In summary, most of what Ancient Aliens uses on this point is from a bogus 20th century channeled text, which they dishonestly present as an ancient text. And even the real descriptions of Amanas get some tweaking by them in order to make it sound like a UFO. The development of the idea of Amanas in Hindu mythology can be traced easily, and it loses all of its intrigue for the ancient astronaut theorists when you do that. In the ancient texts of Sumeria, we have descriptions of these beings descending from the sky called the Anunnaki. The term Anunnaki means those who from the heavens came. This is entirely wrong. The word Anunnaki means princely seed or princely blood. The idea is that the Anunnaki were direct creations of Anu, who was regarded as the father and king of the gods. As we will see, this is the main idea associated with the Anunnaki in the minds of the Sumerians. That is, that the Anunnaki were directly created by Anu. And so it makes sense that even their name reflects this idea. That is, that they were the offspring of the prince. The term itself means of royal seed or princely seed, because the Anunnaki were considered the offspring of Anu or An, uh, the great god of heaven. And also we have, again, Anunnaki, they were also the offspring of An and his consort, Ki, the heaven and earth. Uh, these, again, this divine coupling, the way the Mesopotamians conceived uh, their pantheon. So if the term Anunnaki means princely seed or offspring of the prince, how is it that ancient aliens says that the word Anunnaki means those who from heaven to earth came? The short answer is that everything that ancient aliens says here about the Anunnaki comes from a man named Zachariah Sitchin. Sitchin wrote many books claiming that the Anunnaki were really aliens. Unfortunately, at the time that he wrote this, in the 70s, there weren't many ways for ordinary people to see if what he was saying was true or not. To put it simply, Sitchin's translation of the word Anunnaki is wrong. Now, you'll often read, especially in the writings of Zechariah Sitchin, that the Anunnaki means something like, you know, they who from heaven came, or again, some, some other sort of description that makes them sound like aliens or extraterrestrials. Uh, there isn't a source on the planet by any Sumerian scholar uh, that would agree with that definition. Again, it's not a difficult term. Uh, I personally don't think that Sitchin knew Sumerian at all, because if you're going to get even a term associated with a very important group of deities, if you're not going to get that right, then I have to wonder what else you're going to get wrong. Sitchin claimed to be an expert on Sumerian writings, yet we can now see that he didn't seem to even understand the basic grammar and vocabulary rules of the Sumerian language. Several real scholars challenged him on his translations and on his lack of any academic credentials in the field, pointing out that there is no record of Sitchin having anything but a journalism degree. One such scholar is Dr. Michael Heiser. To this day, I haven't been able to find nor have other people whom I've asked to help uh, people who like Sitchin, I've never been able to find any actual credentials uh, of him knowing any of the languages or being credentialed in any way in ancient Near Eastern studies. 
As we progress and look into some of the specifics of Sitchin's views, articulated here by ancient aliens, I think you will see that determining the truth about this difficult subject is not out of the hands of the common person. It says, word for word, that these beings descended in flying vehicles from the sky. This is a preposterous statement. I challenge anyone to produce this word for word text. You can do a search online and literally see all the references to the word Anunnaki in the Sumerian texts. The only time it refers to anything even close to this is when it talks about the Anunnaki being direct creations of Anu in heaven. A few examples of this would be the Anuna, the gods whom An conceived in the sky, or the Anuna whom An in the sky conceived. These texts emphasize the point that the main Sumerian concept regarding the Anunnaki was that they were directly created by An. That's what's being said here. The idea that the texts say that they descended out of flying vehicles is pure fiction, and that's the nicest way that I can think of to say that. What Ancient Aliens does here is they show pictures of the winged solar disk as they talk about the Anunnaki, and I guess they expect the audience to think that these texts speak of these disks like spacecraft in the Sumerian stories, when in fact the solar disks seen in the iconography are not associated with the Anunnaki at all but rather with the sun and or the sun god. This is probably why Tsoukalos says the following. And they were always described or depicted in floating above some quote-unquote regular people. Since the Anunnaki are never depicted floating above people's heads, we can see that they want people to believe that the solar disk icon equals the Anunnaki spacecraft. This is wrong for several reasons. Number one, the solar disks in the Sumerian culture really did represent the sun or the sun god. The sun traveling across the sky every day was seen to have been facilitated by wings on the sun. You need to know that there is nothing in these descriptions of the sun in the Sumerian texts that would suggest that they were really talking about a UFO. As boring as it may be, they were really talking about the sun. One way to demonstrate this is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh worships Shamash, the sun god, in order to get favor for part of his journey. And he does this by facing east in the morning, that is, in the direction of the rising sun. The idea that ancient aliens proposes here, that the Anunnaki actually came out of the solar disks, or that they were pictured riding in them, is just a lie. There's no way around it. We can find not only descriptions of the Anunnaki, but also depictions. And we can see them in statues, in carvings. So it's all very interesting to see that those beings looked like modern day space travelers with weird suits. Some of them wore wrist watches. They had boots on and helmets and above all, wings. All throughout the Ancient Alien series, they show these pictures of Akkadian winged genies and refer to them as Anunnaki. But funnily enough, winged genies aren't Anunnaki. In fact, these reliefs aren't even Sumerian. They're Akkadian. But hey, while we're here, we might as well explain what's going on in these images, even though they have absolutely nothing to do with the Anunnaki. The belief was that certain aspects of nature were controlled by these winged genies. Most notably, they were responsible for the fertilization of the crops. They were often depicted with a bucket of pollen or water in one hand, and a group of male flowers or a pine cone in the other hand. They often are depicted as fertilizing a date tree, which was a symbol of fruitfulness. Sometimes they would be depicted as being pointed at the king, which because of the accompanying inscriptions, we know means that the king was seen to be a type of intermediary between the gods and responsible for the fruitfulness of the land and the people. One way to demonstrate this is by explaining what ancient aliens calls a wristwatch. First, you should take note that if this is a watch, then these genies were serious about timekeeping because they wore one of these on both wrists and often on a headband as well. This watch is actually an Akkadian symbol for Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. You can see the same rosette on the famous Ishtar gate in Babylon. The fertility of the land was associated with, as you might expect, the goddess of fertility, and these beings are depicted as acting on behalf of Ishtar as they fertilize this date tree. This also probably explains the wings, considering that the natural and visible way that a flower is pollinated is through bees and birds. 
Therefore, it's not so hard to see that they were depicting their spiritual agents of pollination with wings as well. Zechariah Sitchin has essentially suggested that the reason why we were visited in the remote past is because the ancient astronauts' home planet needed gold for their atmosphere and that their gold content in the atmosphere was depleting. So they came to Earth in order to mine gold and bring it back to their home planet. This idea about aliens coming to mine gold for their atmosphere in the ancient past is widely repeated by ancient astronaut theorists. In fact, it's become something of a foundational idea in the movement. This idea traces directly back to Zachariah Sitchin and has absolutely nothing to do with Sumerian texts. It's interesting to note that Sitchin doesn't even give a place in the Sumerian texts to justify this notion that they needed gold for their atmosphere. He says the following in his book, The Wars of Gods and Men. The metal, with its unique properties, was needed back home for a vital need. As best as we can make out, this vital need could have been for suspending the gold particles in Nibiru's waning atmosphere and thus shield it from critical dissipation. So he says, as best as we can make out. Well, who is we? And what text would even hint at that idea? Sitchin never says. He simply creates this idea of gold particles being needed in a planet's atmosphere out of nowhere. Nowadays, you can do a word search for the uses of the word gold in the Sumerian texts. We can read every mention of this word. Not only are the mentions of the word gold relatively few in the Sumerian texts, there is nothing to indicate anything but the most ordinary uses for gold. In fact, it's a surprisingly boring study. Thanks to the meticulous cataloging of the Sumerian texts over the last few decades and the advent of the internet, we no longer have to take people like Sitchin's word for it. There are some databases online that allow you to search through Sumerian texts. And I have a video on my uh, website, www.sitchinisrong.com. If you go there and you click on the Anunnaki tab, I will show you how to search through something called the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature. I'll show you how you can search for all the occurrences of the word Anunnaki and then click through to English translations of all those occurrences. You can find this material, and I would encourage you to do so because you can check up on Zechariah Sitchin, you can check up on me. Uh, when I claim that there are no texts, there are no tablets that have, for instance, the Anunnaki on Nibiru or associated with Nibiru, that Nibiru isn't a planet beyond Pluto, when I say those things, how easy would it be to prove me wrong if you knew how to search for those terms. It'd be real easy. And I encourage you to check up on me, check up on everybody else, and do the work. You can access this material and know who's telling you the truth. We can finally see for ourselves why the Sumerian scholars have been so critical of Sitchin. Not because they're too close-minded or anything like that, but rather because Sitchin really doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. Let me give you an example of how Sitchin comes up with his, quote, amazing translations. Let's take this idea that the Sumerian texts speak of mining gold. Now, since the Sumerian texts do not speak of mining gold in any way, Sitchin has to construct this idea out of thin air. This is how he did it. I'll read from his first book, The Twelfth Planet. Quote, Some Mesopotamian hymns to Ea exalt him as bel Nimiki, translated Lord of Wisdom. But the correct translation should undoubtedly be Lord of Mining. In classic Sitchin style, he never gives any reason that the, quote, correct translation should undoubtedly be Lord of Mining. He just says it should be and leaves it at that. Again, we have Sumerian dictionaries written by the Sumerian scribes themselves, and the Sumerians don't agree with Sitchin here. So why should we? I think one way to demonstrate how bad of a translation this is, is to read a little about E.A. or Inky's wisdom in context, and let you see if it makes sense to you as meaning wisdom, or if it really means mining. This is an example from a Sumerian text called Enuma Elish. It says, He who understands all, the wise one, the great one, E.A. who knows all that is, perceived the plot, he countered it with a powerful spell. Not only does it describe his wisdom further here by saying, quote, he who understands all, 
but it also says that because of this wisdom, he was able to perceive the plot before it happened and counter it. None of what we just read makes sense if wisdom really means mining. Here's another one from the same epic. Ie, who knows all things, knew he could not defeat Kingu and the hosts of Tiamat. Here again we see a contextual definition of Ie's knowledge. He knows all again. We see that his knowledge helped him understand that he could not defeat Kingu. These are not isolated descriptions of this knowledge. Ie is the god of wisdom for a reason. Nothing said about him makes sense if his knowledge means mining, or even knowledge about mining. All the stories about him highlight his great understanding, and conversely, there isn't even a hint that he cares a lick about digging for gold or anything else. It's just not there. It requires an ignorance of the Sumerian texts in order to be believed. Let's move on to another claim about the Anunnaki. Virtually every story that's in Genesis, uh, the flood story, uh, the Adam and Eve story, they all have precedence with the ancient Sumerians. The story that came down to the Sumerians is that the Anunnaki were mining gold on the earth. And uh, the run-of-the-mill workers complain, said, this is really hard work and we're tired. We don't want to do this anymore. And so they had a big council. They decided to create a primitive worker called an Adamo. The Anunnaki created uh, humans as a slave species. The first thing to be aware of here is that in the epic of creation that they're referring to here, the gods weren't mining gold. The work that the gods were doing is creating the world kind of what you would expect from a creation epic. It even specifically states that they were making mountains and rivers, such as the Tigris and Euphrates. The gods here were tired of creating the earth, not gold mining. The epic goes on to describe the following events. The gods decide to mix up themselves with clay and make man. As the version of men that they made increased in number, the noise that they made angered the gods. So they decide to kill them off with a flood. One man is instructed to build a boat, he puts animals on it, it rains for seven days and seven nights, and the man and his family are saved. There are many similarities between these Sumerian writings and to the biblical accounts of the creation of man and Noah's flood. Some people think that this is due to the writers of the Bible copying the earlier Sumerian writings. This is problematic because even the critics who specialize in this style of ancient literature say there is no evidence of literary borrowing. In fact, just the opposite. They propose that they must be referring to a common source for the information. One paper by Heidel, Millard, and Damroche concludes this way, quote, Literary dependence cannot be demonstrated. Here, as in most of the parallels in primeval history, it is considered more likely that the Mesopotamian and biblical traditions are based on a common source. Some understand this common source to be a piece of more ancient literature, while others consider it the actual event. Add to this that it's not just the Sumerian texts and the Bible that are talking about the same basic story, but obvious elements of this story can be found in almost every early culture, regardless of its location. Take for example the story of Viracocha in South America. Viracocha created the heavens and the earth. He then took large stones and breathed life into them, but they became giants, so he sent a flood to wipe them out. After the flood, he breathed into smaller stones than the first time, thereby creating smaller people which were then scattered all over the world. And in the Bible, in Genesis 6, we see something similar. The sons of God disobeyed God. They came to earth, had sex with human women, producing giants called Nephilim. The Nephilim, over time, almost eliminated the original human population, and this is one of the reasons that God sent the flood. These stories are found in some form in cultures as geographically separated as you can get. They're in China, Europe, the Middle East, they are found in Native American traditions, in South America, and many others. These similarities are too obvious to simply dismiss. Things like eight people being on the boat are mentioned in a good percentage of these stories. I personally think that all these cultures are drawing from the same original story, a story that was told only one way, and that as migrations happened from the original group, they started adding in details that were more locally important to them but that each of these cultures sincerely believed that they were passing on the true account of the origin of humanity to their descendants as this story was told. Ironically, if you take it at face value, if there really was a flood and all people except for the ones on the boat were destroyed, and if most modern cultures were descended from them, the fact that the entire world seems to have inherited the same story would make sense. 
because they essentially have the same eight ancestors who experienced such a dramatic event and made it a point to pass the story to each generation. I propose that something like this really did happen in ancient history. I don't personally see any logical way around it. The question I have is which, if any, of these accounts is closest to the truth? Ancient Aliens tells us that the Sumerian version is closest to the truth because they were recorded earlier. That makes sense to a point, but we have to remember that the events described in the Sumerian texts were still ancient history to the Sumerians. So the question is not so much about the date of the writing, but rather their ability to preserve the story. I'll give you a few very good reasons to seriously doubt that the Sumerian accounts should be given more weight where they differ from the others. The first is that Sumerian stories are not logically consistent. Take for example that in both the Sumerian and Biblical accounts, dimensions for the boat are given. The mere fact that an important part of this story is the dimensions of the boat is interesting. But when you draw out the dimensions, you have on the one hand the Sumerian boat being a big cube and the biblical one being described by naval engineers as nearly perfect for maintaining stability without hull damage in incredibly rough seas. Another reason not to trust the Sumerian texts where they differ from the others is that, as every Sumerian scholar knows, the Sumerians constantly change the details of their stories to suit the different situations. For example, Texts of the same story found in the Temple of Inki will differ from the ones found in the Temple of Inyana, even if they are from the same time period, but especially if they're from a different time period. To quote one Sumerian scholar, quote, inconsistencies are a regular feature of Sumerian poetry, end quote. He goes on to say that integration of different texts by the Sumerian scribes often appears somewhat careless. Compare that with the ancient Hebrew scribes, who were notorious for taking their job ultra-seriously. They had many rules that governed their copying of their sacred texts. For example, it is said that they would have to speak every letter out loud before committing it to paper. One example of a vindication of this meticulous attention to detail is with the Isaiah scroll found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The earliest copies of the Hebrew Old Testament before the Dead Sea Scrolls were the Masoretic texts, which were copied between the years 600 and 1000 AD. So the Isaiah scroll, one of the best preserved scrolls, would be a way to prove or disprove if their scriptures had been faithfully copied by the scribes during the previous 800 years. As it turned out, they did a flawless job and the Hebrew scribes were vindicated. So when deciding which texts are more accurate as it relates to their accounts of ancient events, it is far more logical to assume that the group with a tradition of accurate preservation and transmission of their texts should be given more weight than a culture like the Sumerians who seem to have very little interest in the accurate transmission of the details of their stories. To sum up, almost everything that Ancient Alien says about the Anunnaki is untrue, which is not surprising considering they copy and pasted almost everything in this section from the books of Zechariah Sitchin. For more information about Sitchin's errors in his translations of the Sumerian and Akkadian texts, I would direct you to the excellent website of Dr. Michael Heiser, SitchinIsWrong.com. Ancient myths are full of stories of gods descending to earth to mate with humans. According to many sources, including uh, Norse mythology, Greek mythology, and even the Bible, uh, we have the stories of these sons of God or actual gods from Mount Olympus or Valhalla, and they're coming to Earth. They find uh, the daughters of men attractive. According to ancient texts, the fallen angels not only physically mated with the women of Earth, they produced offspring, the Nephilim, a race of giants, similar to those portrayed in the story of David and Goliath. I pretty much agree with how they start off here. There are many texts from all around the world that do seem to be speaking of the same thing. I also think that because of the eerily similar themes in these accounts, it's not wise to dismiss them altogether as a common idea that you would expect independent cultures to invent. I think this topic is worth looking into in depth. Ancient Alien seems to hold two contradictory opinions about this issue. 
On the one hand, they seem to be clear that they believe that extraterrestrials came to Earth in the ancient past and had sexual relationships with human women because they found them attractive. Ancient texts talk about the fact that whoever visited the Earth in a remote past, these gods, thought that Earth women were quite beautiful. So in many occasions, we find stories where those visitors essentially mated with Earth women. It was misinterpreted, misunderstood as something divine that came here. They were flesh and blood extraterrestrials. When you look at Greek mythology and, and many of the mythologies around the world, they have these stories of gods coming down from the sky and have sexual intercourse with these humans and, in a sense, create a new breed of human. When all these encounters happened and when women slept with those gods, which can be found in multiple texts all around the planet, that those women actually had sex with extraterrestrials, not with gods, because gods do not exist. But the view that this event involved lust and sex doesn't fit too well with the ancient astronaut theory. They would prefer the view that what happened was artificial insemination. Today, artificial insemination. That's what happens today. You no longer have to have sex in order to have babies. We have the exact same description thousands of years ago where women without sleeping with anyone all of a sudden became pregnant. The problem is that these texts are so clear that a physical desire for women on the part of the angels was involved. So in order to make artificial insemination appear in the texts, ancient aliens stoops to a new low. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls is called the Lamech Scroll. What is Lamech? Lamech was a shepherd. And one day Lamech, his woman, was pregnant. And he said to her, this is impossible. I was not here for months. But his woman with the name Batinosh swears no one touched me. But Lamech doesn't believe his wife Batinosh and he goes to his father, which was Methuselah. And Methuselah says to Lamech, I can't help you. I don't, I don't understand this. I believe your women, Batinosh, that nobody touched her. And I believe you. So what shall I do? So Methuselah goes to his father, the grandfather now of Lamech. His name is Enoch. Now Enoch tells to Methuselah that the guardians of the sky have made an artificial insemination into the womb of Batenosh, the wife, and he should accept this child because this child would be the father of a new human generation. And in the Bible, this is Noah. They literally lie here. I suppose that von Daniken is banking on the fact that not many people know about the text that he is quoting from, and so they probably won't check his facts. So I guess he feels like he can just straight up lie to people about what it says. Let me break down some of the deceptions in this clip. And one day Lamech, his woman, was pregnant. And he said to her, this is impossible. I was not here for months. The first big lie here is the idea that the reason Lamech doubted that Noah was his son was because he wasn't there for months. When the text clearly explains that the reason he doubted whether Noah was his son was because of the way Noah looked. Von Daniken just inserts, I was not here for months. I guess to make it seem like it couldn't possibly be Lamech's son, which is very deceptive, especially considering that in the text, Bathanash, his wife, actually reminds Lamech of the day they conceived the child. And if you think that's deceptive on the part of Von Daniken, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, Enoch tells to Methuselah that the guardians of the sky have made an artificial insemination into the womb of Batenosh, the wife. This is unbelievable. In the text, Enoch actually says the opposite. Enoch clearly confirms that Noah is the genuine son of Lamech. So not only is Von Daniken bold-faced lying here about what Enoch says about Noah in the text, he is inserting the idea of artificial insemination out of nowhere on top of this lie. So you can see that one of the main founders of the ancient astronaut theory has absolutely no problem lying in order to make the crucial link that they need between the Nephilim and artificial insemination in ancient texts. 
Although I sympathize with the ancient astronaut theorists in that I think that the consistent details in the ancient texts about the Nephilim lead us to the conclusion that something weird really did happen in the ancient past, I don't think that the evidence points to it being extraterrestrials from another planet. Well, the whole Nephilim passage, uh, Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4, is admittedly weird. Uh, it's one of those go-to weird passages in the Bible that seems to come up uh, especially among people who would really resist or not have a supernatural worldview. But as weird as it is, the, the key there is a supernatural worldview. If we believe that there are uh, intelligent beings outside our own uh, created world, our own material world, if we believe in this thing we call the supernatural, and if you have a supernatural entity, why would you limit a supernatural entity from doing that. Again, on what basis would you have for limiting that property? If you're going to allow for that, then this idea of being able to mingle with human flesh on some level or in some way uh, proceeds from, from those assumptions. I think that we've already seen that they are being deceptive with the evidence that they present, but I also think that they are being deceptive with the evidence they are not presenting. For example, in many ancient texts, from the ancient Near East to the ancient Americas, this hybrid or Nephilim event is spoken of in conjunction with a great flood. These stories, with slight variations, describe the flood coming because the hybridization was against the Creator's will. Hey, there's flood stories in all these other ancient cultures, and look at that, so it must be, again, some collective memory and whatnot. And, and that's legitimate, but the problem is, is a lot of those same uh, sources, those same apologists, will conveniently, for one reason or the other, forget uh, to include a lot of the other details that come along with those comparative flood stories. And one of those would be things like uh, cohabitation or some sort of interaction between the divine world and the human world that results in or produces you know, kind of strange offspring like the Nephilim. It's complex and pretty strange, but it's consistent and it is a story that many diverse cultures have passed down to their descendants. They really believed that this unnatural union produced giants. But again, because the consistent stories of the ancient cultures conflict with the ancient astronaut theory, they literally just throw out the evidence. Were they giants? Or is that the wrong word and the correct word should be extraterrestrial? But the word Nephilim really does mean giants and the context of the various stories clearly reinforce this idea. Their height is often described, or the dimensions of their weapons are given, things like that. Uh, the term Nephilim really most accurately means giants. This is the way ancient translators themselves understood it, translators of the Septuagint and Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. It gets pretty complicated to explain why that's the case. On my website, uh, sitchiniswrong.com, if you click on the tab for Nephilim, you'll find an explanation there. Part of the main problem, in my opinion here, is the differences in the definition of the word angel according to the ancient text versus the definition according to modern pop culture. If you wanted to determine what an angel was using the Bible or other Near East text alone, you would conclude that they have fully functional bodies, that they can have meals with people, they grab hold of people, they are often mistaken as humans. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people wanted to rape the angels. We find in the Bible that the angels that decided to rebel and have sex with human women had to leave a certain type of body and exchange it for another one before they could do this. The type of body that they were said to have left is described in this verse as a habitation. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. The word habitation there is a rare Greek word called oketerion, which is used only one other time in the New Testament to describe the type of bodies followers of Christ will attain at the resurrection of the dead. So basically, the angels were said to have left one type of body for another type, and the second type clearly was capable of sex and reproduction according to the Bible. There is biblical precedent for the idea that their flesh can do things our flesh does. In other words, if you're going to assume flesh, then it brings with it the capacities and in some senses the limitations as well. 
In other words, the Bible in detail explains what angels are and what their capabilities with their bodies are, which makes the following line from von Daniken even more deceptive. How can angels have sex? This is impossible. In our point, in our view, angels were something spiritual, not something who has a body and has the feeling of sex, but they had sex. Von Daniken's idea of an angel is defined more by Hallmark cards than ancient texts. Obviously, ancient cultures, including the writers of the Bible, believed that angels could and did have sex with human women. The various elements of this story are too common in ancient cultures to be chalked up to coincidence, in my opinion. But the details of these consistent reports do not benefit the ancient astronaut theory. In fact, if anything, it supports the idea that the narrative of the Bible is true, or at the very least that the specific details of that narrative was believed by cultures as geographically diverse as the Americas, the Middle East, Asia, Europe, and Africa. The idea of the Nephilim is a strange idea, but the idea that the texts which describe them are referring to ancient extraterrestrials does not fit the evidence, which is probably why ancient aliens has to misrepresent the evidence in order to make their points. There are many more topics that we could have covered in this film, like the claim that this Egyptian relief is depicting a gray alien, which in more high resolution pictures can be seen to be a plant and a vase which is depicted in many other places in Egyptian art. Or this supposed ancient rocket ship sculpture, which according to this Turkish article written in 2003 is a fake. The article quotes the curator of the Turkish museum saying it's about 25 years old and made of plaster. Ancient Aliens goes on to make many more claims throughout their series, but I believe we have covered the best that they had to offer in this film. I could go on to debunk all the other claims that they make, and to a certain extent I will on the Ancient Aliens debunked website, which I hope to make a hub for this type of information. But the main thing I want to stress is that this is not about ancient aliens getting a few claims wrong here and there, but their main theory still being true. That's not a tenable belief in light of this information. You have seen the unmistakable symptoms of the entire theory being wrong. I would also ask you to take a long, hard look at the authors and speakers and charismatic personalities that led you to believe some of the things that I hope you can now see are wrong. I hope that this film helps you to realize that they are not as smart as they have led us to believe, and to consider what else they may have taught you that isn't true. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be taken in by this kind of thing. We must be people with higher standards when it comes to verifying what is true. Do not become enslaved to an authority figure. They should always be willing to direct you to information so that you can do the work and you can check on them. If they don't, you should be suspicious. Again, this is just something that as a professor, uh, as a scholar, I try to get my students to, to consider and think about. Because let's face it, how many of us are really into this kind of stuff? Uh, ancient languages, how many people do that? You, you get a, somebody who comes along like Zechariah Sitchin and starts spouting things about Sumerian and Akkadian and Hebrew and whatnot. Uh, how many people really have the ability to check up on them? Well, the answer is not many, and it just sounds like a horrible amount of work to gain that knowledge so that you can evaluate what they say, and I understand that. But you should not let that allow you to check your brain in at the door. You should ask that source, that person, hey, where can I look? What can I do? What can I access to try to test what you're saying? Please visit the website ancientaliensdebunk.com to see the different sections of this film or to download it for your own personal use. Feel free to use this film in any way that you see fit, except for charging for it in any way. Thanks for your time.